So as most of you know, the LT4 is about a 650 horsepower crate engine that GM puts in the Camaro and the Corvette. This engine is considered one of the most powerful engines you can buy on pump gas. You know, we're seeing some other engines out there, 700, 800, 1,000 horsepower, but when it, you talk about something that you can drive every day, run regular pump gas in, this engine is considered one of the best. GM really put a lot of time into the engineering of this engine to keep it reliable and powerful. And we're going to go through some of the features in this engine after Wendy gets it unwrapped. All right, so while she's doing that, let's look at a couple of things. This is our wastegate. I think GM calls it something else, and we'll revisit that. Here's a little package that came with it. This is our intercooler pump, some caps. This is our intercooler. There is an intercooler inside of this intake. They call it a heat exchanger, and it's water to air. It's not air to air like some of the other intercoolers you're used to. Here we have a purge valve. I think GM calls it an evaporative emissions valve, but it's really a purge valve. And in the GM performance engine, and this is something we're going to talk about, we're going to go through these instructions. This engine is essentially a production engine. However, because the GM controller kit is not meant to meet federal standards, there's a lot of technology that's not used or incorporated into the GM performance over-the-counter engines. However, the technology is still in the engine. One technology is the active fuel management. Now, this engine does have all the active fuel management equipment in it, but the GM controller package does not utilize it because they don't know the weight of the vehicle and other, there's other concerns with active fuel management. One of the things that we do is we're going to be using a factory harness, factory calibration. So we're going to be using all this technology. This is our throttle body. We've got dual TPSs in here. That's throttle position sensors. And they're synchronized so that if there's an error, you go into reduced power. There's a similar setup in the APP or the accelerator pedal position sensor, and they're synchronized. Remember, GM uses what's called TAC, throttle actuator control. And there's three main components to that the throttle body with the throttle position sensor, the accelerator pedal position sensor, and of course the ECM. Inside the ECM is the TAC mod. It's a separate module from the other modules inside of the E92. This is a barrow or a MAP sensor, manifold absolute pressure sensor. This is obviously going to sense manifold vacuum before the blower. And then on these LT4s, you've got another one back here to sense the pressure after the blower. And that just gives the operating system some more information to work off of. We're going to talk about some of these connectors later. Let's move this out of the way. GM does use a pretty standard flywheel on these, but one thing that you might want to note is that the LTs have an 8-bolt pattern versus the earlier LS, Gen 3, Gen 4, small block, big block, 6-bolt pattern. We are running a really nice stainless steel manifold on these engines. These engines run what's called coil on plug. Back in the 1990s, we were trying to get rid of distributors, and some manufacturers, uh, I remember Ford did the dual plug coil. Actually having a single coil per cylinder has advantages. Not only can the computer control each cylinder individually, but there's less chance of failure, and the coil and plug has pretty much become the standard for these engines, and it's really a reliable, excellent setup. GM's got a lot of insulation in this manifold. They're trying to keep the noise down. If we take a look at this side of the engine, we can see that GM incorporated an oil cooler for the engine oil. This engine does have a multi-stage oil pump. It's got actually multiple oil pumps for different pressures depending on demand. We're not going to be running this in our Jeeps because there's just not enough clearance with the drive shaft and the differential. But what we are going to run is a billet plate that's going to bring the oil out to an external cooler. And we'll show you that later on in a build. These engines do have a cross-bolted 6-bolt main cap. That's massively strong, and not only that, the block is skirted, which means it comes down below the crankshaft and boxes it in. So this is definitely stronger than the earlier small block and big blocks. Now, the Gen 3 and the Gen 4 went to this same architecture, so they have the advantage of the skirted block also. Coming around the engine, you can see we got some bleeders here for the intercooler. Here we're going to have our thermostat outlet and you can see that there is a steam port here. Now this is different than the LS's because the LS's had a steam port that went between the heads. At least it had a pipe between the heads and then it came into a T. GM has really done something special with this cooling system and I'm not really sure what but I can tell you these LT's run cooler than the LS's even though they have higher compression. I'm not sure what Magic GM did there but the LT's have less cooling issues than the LS's so that's a good thing. Now, this is our wastegate, as I want to call it, but GM calls it something else. Uh, and this is computer controlled. So basically, this is what's going to limit our boost. 
The boost on this engine is set up to 9.7 PSI, and that is massive in my opinion when you consider this engine is 10 to 1. You old hot rod guys might remember that in the old days when we put a turbo or a supercharger on an engine, we would drop that compression ratio down to 7, 8 to 1 so that we could put 8 pounds of boost into it and not overpressurize the engine. Well, we've got some technology going on here that's going to allow us to run more pressure. A 10 to 1 engine with a 9.7 blower on it is uh, massive, has the potential of a lot of horsepower. And we have to be careful now. The LT4 is running direct injection, and most of you know that direct injection is a huge improvement over port or sequential fuel injection. So running the direct injection in combination with this cam phasing, this is our cam sensor over here, this is our cam phasing solenoid, and this is our oil pressure control means that we can control this technology a lot better than we could in the old days. So by being able to control cylinder pressure means that we can run the higher compression, take advantage of the extra power that we can get out of the higher cylinder pressure and still be safe. And it's all done through computer control. Now some of the aftermarket applications are not going to use a computer controlled wastegate, but I think it's something that we're going to incorporate into our bills because it's just one step better than not. I can tell you stories from the 1970s and 80s running the old Gale Banks blow-through systems, turbochargers, and blowing the bonnets off the carburetors and all, <laughs> all the stuff we went through back in that day to get horsepower. We are running an eight groove belt for the supercharger. You don't want that to slip. You notice that this balancer actually has three sets of grooves. One's going to run the air conditioning, one's going to run the water pump and the alternator, one's going to run the blower. We are going to fit a Type 2 GM power steering pump right here. In fact, let me show you that mount. Now, on this build, we did install a PSC full hydro assist. You can see we got plenty of room, and this is a MoTeC mount that we have made for this vehicle. Here's another option. This is a billet mount that just came out from ICT, and it's going to mount a Type 2 GM power steering pump, which is an excellent pump, to the LT4. So we're going to do that in another LT4 build. We've actually got three LT4, well, four LT4 builds going on right now. So still looking at the front of the engine, I did mention that we've got multiple oil pumps in here and multiple pressure relief valves. I think they regulate this engine to about 87 PSI. Remember, we do have active fuel management in this engine, or at least we have the hardware. So we're going to use the active fuel management where the GM controller package does not. But oil pressure is very important. So they have multiple oil pressure regulators to keep the oil pressure under control because you don't want to overpressurize those lifters and damage them. This is a catch can. We're going to scavenge off the crankcase up into this can. Now GM doesn't run this in the truck motors and we haven't had any issues, but the LT1s, the LT4s do have it. And essentially what we're doing is we're pulling these vapors out of the crankcase and recirculating them so that they don't go to the back side of the intake valve and a lot of you know that the direct injection goes right into the chamber it doesn't go to the back side of the valve and keep it clean GM has a lot of technology into the PCV or positive crankcase ventilation in this engine and the first step is to scavenge the crankcase properly and collect that waste oil and that's exactly what this can does and I think that GM's looking out again this engine has not just been designed for horsepower that's easy this engine has been designed for the long haul this engine has been designed so that your wife can drive it to the store and have perfect drivability but you can go out and race it on the weekend weekend after weekend year after year GM's looking for reliability here and they're looking to do that on pump gas and when it comes to pump gas engines I think this thing is top of the pile I know there's some other engines out there rated at more horsepower but horsepower is not where it's at. We talked about horsepower versus torque. And if you consider that this engine is about 650 horsepower, you got to take into account how much torque this engine has with direct injection and with continuous variable valve timing. And that really takes it over the top, especially when you made it to an 8 or a 10 speed. The bottom line is this engine will probably outrun some of the 700 horsepower engines just because of the torque and the transmission that it's running. So let's move around the engine. We already talked about how we have our scavenge tube here. We've got some ultra fast knock sensors. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can get a look at this back here, GM has stuck with a 58 times crank sensor. The 58 time crank sensor is used with a four times cam sensor up front. And this does a couple of things, or it's basically a 60 tooth minus two wheel. It gives us more accuracy where the crankshaft is in its rotation. And then when you combine that with a four times cam signal,
it pretty much tells the computer where that engine is at any point. Now one of the things that GM says is over time as let's say the timing chain wears that camshaft and crankshaft relationship are going to change and we got CVVT in this engine. So having that high count trigger wheel on the crankshaft and the four times cam sensor means even as the engine wears the operating system will take into account that timing chain wear and the change in the relationship between the camshaft and the crankshaft. This is the knock sensor and there's two knock sensors and they're ultra fast. So this knock sensor can actually detect cylinder knock on each individual cylinder and then retard or advance the timing on that cylinder. Now if you think about it, we got coil on plug, so we got ignition control of each cylinder. We've got a knock sensor that controls spark for each cylinder. We've got fuel injectors that are individual and sequential. So essentially each one of these cylinders is a single cylinder engine. Now there's eight of them together and of course there's some shared commonalities there, but each cylinder on this engine can be controlled individually. I remember back in the day before OBD2, like in the early 90s or the late 80s, if you had a cylinder go bad, you basically had an engine that went fat, went into some kind of a rich mode, where after OBD2, with individual cylinder monitoring, we have much better control for failure modes. And that's another reason that we have to run the OE harnesses is for those failure modes. Now we've talked about these connectors a lot, guys, and they're the same connector, so make sure you plug them in right. This is going to be your high and your low pressure sensors and your direct injection control and some other stuff. So I'm not going to get into that. You can watch some of the earlier videos if you want to know more about that. But just know that these connectors are the same. Don't swap them. They control your injectors and some other things under the intake. GM has gone to a forged crankshaft on the LT4. And given that this engine can put out close to 700 horsepower, I think that was a good choice. This engine does not come with a pilot bearing. And if you're going to run this engine with a manual transmission, make sure that you put that in. I gotta say, back in the day when I was putting manual transmissions in vehicles, we had these dowel pins and we used to make offset dowel pins to get the clutches lined up right, otherwise you get clutch chatter. And I think back at all the issues and battles we had to make these things run right. And today you can bolt on an eight or a 10 speed transmission that is not only much stronger, but has much better gearing and performance and economy and drivability than anything we had in the old days. And it's just something you can bolt on as an old-time mechanic, I don't think the younger mechanics can really appreciate what they have today, what a marvel this engine is. This engine is all aluminum, doesn't weigh much more than a stock 3.8 engine, yet it's putting out near 700 horsepower, and GM had to build this engine to last, like I said, for years and warranty this engine. This engine does come with these shorty-style headers that are beautiful, and they do look like stainless. They might not be full stainless. They might be some kind of alloy, but notice that they're using a full four bolt flange. I really like that. The old LS3s ran a two bolt flange, trucks ran a three bolt flange, but these LTs were running a four bolt flange and there's an obvious reason for that. Running the cylinder pressure these things are running means that there's a lot of exhaust coming out of this manifold and you want to have four bolts sealing it. Look at the flanges on these manifolds. These look like close to half inch and you can see that they sectioned it here so that this can expand and contract and not warp the flange. In the old days, I've seen headers with as little as eighth inch. We used to go to three eighths inch thinking that was heavy duty, but this is just massive. Everything on this engine is, is overbuilt. This here is going to be your fuel inlet, and we're going to talk about the fuel system in detail because this is going to be an inlet from a low pressure fuel system, and the low pressure fuel system is not one pressure, it's variable. It can go as low as 40 something PSI and as high as 70 something PSI. And one of the things about fuel injection, especially direct injection, is we can only run so much fuel through these direct injectors. And we've got to make sure that this engine is fueled because if there's not fuel in the chamber, whatever is next is going to burn. I remember doing work with Christopher Jacobs at Jacobs Electronics in our nitrous safety kit. And you start putting liquid oxygen into an engine, it's going to burn the fuel, then it's going to burn the valve or the piston or whatever's next. So we want to make sure that this engine has fuel. So we're going to increase the fuel pressure on the low side to the high pressure pump, which is inside the intake, and make sure that this engine is fueled. Now on the LT5, they went one step further and they actually installed port injectors inside the intake to supplement the direct injectors so that you have enough fuel to get 800 plus horsepower. This is going to be a vent tube. There's going to be one on the other side over here. And then we're going to have another one here. So all three of these are going to be part of the crankcase ventilation system and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. This here is obviously the drive for our blower and we went to an eight groove pulley because there's going to be a lot of stress on 
that belt. And I'm actually surprised that GM's running 9.7 PSI on its blower when the static compression is 10 to 1, especially on pump gas. I think GM has done a phenomenal job to keep this engine streetable. Yeah, there's engines out there that put a lot more horsepower up. And GM didn't just design this engine for horsepower. Getting horsepower is easy. GM designed this engine for horsepower, drivability, emissions, longevity, and to run on pump gas. And that's important because most of you aren't going to be running 100 octane fuel driving around every day. Every once in a while your wife might have to drive this thing to the store to get bread. And this engine will idle just like a stalker yet you can take it to the track. So looking at the front of the engine again, we can see that the Camaro has the water pump on this side of the engine. Truck has a water pump on this side. We've actually run some of these Camaro pumps on bills where the guys have the XD boxes. And I'm going to say, if you got an XD box and you got a hydraulic ram, I just take the XD box off and run a ram because you're kind of redundant at that point. So GM did carry on the tradition of the sub harness. So this little harness here is going to come up. I'm just going to do our cam sensor, our cam phaser. And I'm sorry guys, we're right outside of Nellis. And these F-35s are loud. Our dual stage oil pump. And guys, there's no reason not to run a purge valve. What the purge valve does is basically evacuate the fuel vapors from the canister. Some of you hot rod guys may not run this, and even in the instructions for the LT4 it says it's not going to affect engine performance. But as an emissions guy for a lot of years, I can tell you this really isn't going to hurt your performance at all. So go ahead and hook it up. It's a pretty simple setup. You do need to run a fuel tank pressure sensor and an EVAP vent solenoid to do it properly. And of course, running the factory harness, we are going to do that. I do want to say that this engine has multiple temperature sensors. We've got a temperature sensor here for the coolant. We've got an air intake temp sensor in the intake, as well as a humidity sensor and a mass airflow sensor. And I am pretty sure that this engine's also running an after blower temperature sensor for the air that comes out of the blower. Because remember, when you compress the air, you increase the temperature and the computer wants to know that for better control. So my opinion of this engine as a long time mechanic and hot rodder is just wow. If you look at the technology in this thing for the cost, it really is a good value for dollar. Being all aluminum means it's relatively light. Having two overhead valves means it's simple and reliable. GM did not go to a multi-valve system. There is not the weight of the iron block, but with the skirted cross bolted mains. We've got a very solid bottom end that can handle well over 600 horsepower. The ability to run it on pump gas with 9.7 PSI blower and 10 to 1 is still amazing to me. This engine has to be top of the line when it comes to everyday street driven engines and the amount of power and drivability it puts out. I mean if you look at a Maserati or a Lamborghini V12, 4 valve, 5 valve, whatever, putting out similar horsepower to this and this is just a good old American V8 with two valve overhead valve technology. It's pretty amazing. And the Corvettes not only put out that power, but they go out there and they run in Nuremberg and they're running right up there with the exotics in Europe at a fraction of the cost. You could purchase an entire Corvette with a LT4 engine for probably less than an engine would cost you on some of these exotics. And this technology is now available to you in a box. So let's go inside and let's look at some of the documentation that's supplied with it. Alright, so here we are with the instructions. LT4 engine specs, PAR number, well I guess this is Golf. <laughs> Just a joke. Thank you for choosing our parts, exceed expectations, all that's really good. It's based on the fifth generation Corvette LT4. This engine requires engine control system which is available. Now here's a big deal. The over-the-counter Chevrolet performance controller packages are just that. They're over-the-counter controller packages, and it's not what we do. We do OE production controllers and harnesses. And as you're going to see in these instructions, there's a lot of things that are inhibited when you run the over-the-counter controller. One is it's not emissions legal. Obviously, the over-the-counter GM performance packages are designed for non obd 2 vehicles, so that would be 2000 Ah, boy, I'm dating myself. That would be 1995 and earlier. So let's keep going down. Legal information. Here's what you get. Okay, cylinder deactivation. That's active fuel management. On this engine, cylinders 1, 7, 6, and 4 can switch into a V4 mode. 
on the newer L87, all the cylinders can switch into a deactivation mode. So coming down here to cylinder deactivation, you'll notice that cylinders 1, 7, 6, and 4 can be shut off by the computer to go into a V4 mode. The new L87 LT actually has more cylinder deactivation modes, but in the LT4 and the LT1, this is what we get. Now, if you read this, it basically says that there are many inputs and there's a lot of unknown parameters. So GM Performance turns off active fuel management in your GM Performance controller. Now, we're running factory harnesses, factory computers, so we can support active fuel management in our OE operating systems. And this is a big advantage in the way that we do our swaps. The ignition system is coil on plug and you will notice that we have a 58 times crank sensor as I mentioned earlier and a four times cam signal. And what that basically means is the computer knows where that crankshaft is within a couple of degrees in the full four cycle mode. That means it can give better fuel and ignition delivery. The LTs did supply the humidity sensor. We've talked about that several times. So humidity is another variable now that we can take into account for better fuel control and spark control. We are running the coil on plug ignition as we discussed, which in my opinion is the best because each cylinder can be individually controlled. And not only that, but if there's a failure, you're running on seven cylinders instead of a six cylinder, or in the case of the old coils, no cylinders. The Iridium tip spark plugs, I guess, are a big advantage because they can go the distance. I've run the Platinums and others, and I always put the Iridiums in. I know they're more expensive. However, I do find that you can pull them out with 80,000 miles on them, and they're still working well. Now, the fuel system is very important on the LT. And if you read this, we're using a returnless variable flow pressure system on the low side. And what that means is the low pressure pump has variable voltage going to it to control the pressure. And we talked about this in the last video. The Chevrolet Performance Engine Kit includes this variable speed pump and the fuel pump control module. A returnless fuel system basically means you only have one line pushing fuel forward. And what that does is it doesn't allow the fuel to come back into the tank. So you don't push it forward into a regulator on the rail of the engine and then back because what you're doing is you're building heat up and when you build heat up you're building evaporative emissions up and you don't want to put that back into the tank so somewhere here it probably tells you that yeah the speed of the fuel pump and not returning hot fuel from the engine into the fuel tank and as you can see this pump can go up to 72 psi and when this LT4 is really honking we're putting out over 600 horsepower we need to increase that low pressure so that the high pressure pump doesn't go dry. We want 45 gallons per hour and we are running a factory LT4 pump in our application with heavy duty or heavy gauge wires so we shouldn't have a problem there. The high pressure pump is obviously inside the engine. It's driven by a three lobe cam on the camshaft and this pressure is controlled by a solenoid controlled valve that is operated by the engine control module. So that's pretty sophisticated stuff for an over-the-counter system. Crankcase ventilation, we talked about this on the engine and here's our vents and we're trying to keep the blow-by from going back into the heads. The positive crankcase ventilation system in the LT4 is very advanced and the more and the more contamination that we can keep from getting out of the crankcase and going back into the heads, the better. So if you read this, basically we are using a PCV valve, positive crankcase ventilation valve, and that uses engine vacuum to scavenge and pull contaminants out of the crankcase. And then that is, in this case, put into a catch can. What we're trying to do is keep that contamination from getting back into the engine and to the back side of the valves. And I think GM has done a pretty good job at that. As we move on, we do purchase the factory vent tubes and such. They're very cheap. These things cost $5, $10, so you might as well get the part numbers. I think they give you some part numbers down here that you can order those parts. Variable camshaft timing. Now, while they don't go into this very in-depth, variable valve timing is extremely important because it allows us to control cylinder pressure. And basically what it does is it changes the relationship between the camshaft and the crankshaft. And as you will see, at idle, you can advance it to get a smoother idle and you can phase it to get more performance on the top. At higher RPM, it, it will retard. So the variable valve timing in these engines is a big part of why they can do what they can do and why we can run the higher compression and why we can run so much PSI out of these LT4 engines. And you can see down here that it also mentions that VVT can be
effective for controlling exhaust emissions. And I think GM has some patented technology for not only reducing NOx, that is, we eliminate the EGR valve, but we can keep the backside of the valves clean and we can reduce NOx emissions through this VVT. And it's a really complex technology and they're just kind of touching on that here. Here's our blower unit and the LT4 uses a roots type blower. I'm a big roots type blower guy. I know the centrifugal blowers have their advantages. I did some work with Joe Granatelli back at Paxton and they made a lot of advancements in and centrifugal blowers still have their place but I think these roots style blowers are packaged so well in the V of the V8 especially when you consider they're putting intercoolers in there that the compactness and the power that these things can put out and I must say that the noise level is much lower than it used to be in the old days we used to get a lot of blower wine especially with the blowers that were designed for airplanes today they're pretty darn quiet you don't even notice it until you get on it so what we've got here are rotors with four lobes helical twist they are run with a minimum clearance, which means they're really tight. They're not in contact with each other. And what I take by that is that there are not seals on this, Teflon seals, because as you know, some of these blower lobes do run uh, Teflon seals. You can comment below if they are running Teflon seals, but I'm not aware that they are. So we got some self-lubricating, non-serviceable bearings, as we discussed, and a drive belt pulley. The upper intake manifold also houses the integrated cooler, and like I say, I'm a big fan of that. Cooling air enhances the effectiveness of the supercharger. Now, the lower the intake air temperature is, pretty much the more power we can put out. So with a blower, when you compress air, you're building up heat, and we've got to put that heat somewhere. So the water-to-air intercooler, or heat exchanger as they call it here, is, in my opinion, the most effective at doing that and you're also not running these giant four or five inch pipes all over the place you're just running basically heater hoses as mentioned there's a variety of sensors to monitor air temperature and pressure the water manifold located at the front transfers blah 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 operation the supercharger is designed to increase the air pressure yes we know that since before world war ii the excess air creates boost pressure blah blah, blah. look at this 9.7 psi that's really out there if you consider that a lot of these add-on blowers to the jk's are four, five, six, maybe eight PSI with a high altitude. We're running near 10 PSI in an engine that's 10 to one, and that's very impressive. The positive displacement, blah, blah, blah. The charge air bypass valve is vacuum electronically controlled. And here's something that's important. This is controlled by the engine control module. And what that means is the engine control module is basically controlling your wastegate. Now, they're not calling it a wastegate here. They're calling it a charge air bypass valve. But essentially what that does is it limits how much boost the supercharger can put into the engine. In the old days, we had some very primitive vacuum-controlled wastegates. And if that wastegate stuck, I've seen, <laughs> I had a small block once it hit 21 PSI, and it blew the bonnet right off because it was a blow-through system on a carburetor. It blew the bonnet right off the intake and through the windshield of the uh, van. It happened to be a van that I had uh, turbocharged. So this is a very important valve, not only for drivability, but also for uh, safety. You want to make sure that that's controlled properly. Superchargers have been required to have blow-off devices, especially in competition like the NHRA, because if you get a blower that runs away, it can cause all sorts of damage. And that's why you see those straps on the blowers, on the dragsters. If the wastegate or whatever is controlling the boost fails, you don't want to have a massive failure. So I'm pretty sure GM spent a lot of time figuring out how to keep this safe. Uh, coolant, um, again, as mentioned earlier, the cooling system in these engines is just phenomenal. I don't know exactly what GM is doing, but you can buy heater hoses if you want. Here's the engine oil pump, and there's a couple of oil pumps as I described. Uh, anything over 87 PSI, there's a pressure relief valve. I believe it's in the primary pump up here. If the pressure exceeds, it will open exhaust and vent back into the, yeah. So basically you've got a typical oil pressure system, but you've got multiple pumps. There's a primary pump, and then there's a secondary pump. And they're doing that for efficiency and other reasons. Just know that the oiling systems in these engines is not simple anymore. They've taken it to the next level to get to get you that economy. And, and not only that, keeping an engine like this alive with over 600 horsepower on pump gas, driving it every day with 10 to 1 compression and 9.7 pounds of boost, requires a pretty robust oiling system. And fortunately, the GM engineers have done their job because these engines are out there and production vehicles running on the track and they hold together.
the LT4 engine uses a oil spray piston cooling. That's actually pretty standard. We've been doing that for a lot of years, and we also spray uh, the oil onto the cylinder walls to keep them cool and reduce the friction. We're supplied with a standard flex plate, as we discussed, and remember the LTs run an 8 bolt flex plate, not the old 6 bolt like the LSs and the earlier small and big blocks. Probably going to warn you here about the uh, pilot bearing. So here's our specs. Yep, here's the pilot bearing. If you want to run a manual transmission, make sure you put that pilot bearing in there. I got to say, an LT4 with a manual transmission has got to be a pretty wild ride. Here's our starter motor and shield. And guys, run the shield. You know, we're running these basically stainless headers, putting a lot of heat into that starter motor. This is a gear reduction type starter motor, so it is a lot lighter than the older direct drive starter motors, and they're very powerful. It really impresses me what we've done with these electronics. I remember starter motors were really heavy and massive, and they really didn't have that much power, but today with these gear reduction starters, they've, they've really improved that. Knock sensors are really important. If you ever get a knock sensor code, fix the problem because these knock sensors, and a blown engine especially, can prevent damage. If you get a runaway blower or if you get a runaway spark knock, it can damage components real quick. I used to work with uh, Jacobs Electronics, as I told you, and in the early days before we really had knock sensors, as I remember the Buick Turbo, like the Grand Nationals, they had some primitive knock sensors built in and they helped. But if you got if you got excessive spark knock, you could uh, damage the lower end real quick. Okay, so they're calling this an evaporative emissions valve. Really what it is is your purge valve. And what this is doing is it's pulling the vapors out of the canister, the evap canister, which is pulling the vapors out of the fuel tank, and then putting it back through the intake. And like I said, I don't really think there's any harm with this. You're not going to be losing any power with this. It's going to keep you from smelling fuel in your garage. In my opinion, it's just the way to go. In my opinion, run the thing if you can. It doesn't really take a lot to get a 1990s Chevy Silverado EVAP canister, get a large vent hose from your fuel tank into that, and then have your little purge port coming off that going forward to this purge valve. You can run the EVAP vent solenoid and the fuel tank pressure sensor and give that feedback to the ECM. I don't know and I don't think these controllers are set up for that, the GM over the counter, but our production controllers and harnesses certainly are and we do that because we want to remain emissions compliant. Let's keep moving down here. The exhaust manifolds, I think these things have really beautiful exhaust manifolds on them and if you were just to buy these manifolds in the aftermarket I don't know what they would cost but that's one of the wonders of of mass production and the economies that you can get with this. And there's your part numbers. Here's an illustration. You want to pressurize the the engine before you crank it over and start it. Back in the old days we used to put a distributor shaft in and drive the oil pump manually and that would build your your pressure up. Here's what they call the charge air cooling system. Basically, that's your intercooler, and they supply you with a pump that is controlled by the ECM. So we're going to be running that. Start up and break in. <laughs> Here, number seven, the engine should be driven at varying lows and conditions for the first 30 miles or an hour without wide up and throttle. Well, I guess you're going to have to have some restraint, not the flora in LT4. It'll run five or six medium throttle accelerations to about 4,000 RPM and then back to idle. I bet you that's going to be fun. Guys, change your oil. I can't tell you how many of my customers take their Jeeps and they come back a year or two later and the oil is just filthy. They've never replaced it. Yeah, these engines can go four or 5,000 miles without an oil change, but if you're out there wheeling hard, you're in the dust and you're in the dirt, check your oil and change it when required. Okay, LT4 specifications. This is going to be interesting. So we got a Gen 5 small block, 376 cubic inches, 6.2 liters. Here's our born or stroke. So this kind of surprises me. Here we've got an engine with a blower on it that's capable of almost 10 pounds of boost, and we're running 10 to 1 static compression ratio. That just tells you how effective the continuous variable valve timing and the direct injection in the combustion chamber technology is. That's just a massive amount of compression considering what we've got here. That also tells me that this engine is capable of putting out as much horsepower as you probably want until something lets go. Cast aluminum, six bolt cross mated block, we talked about that.
Um, let's check our valves out here. Now we're running a 2.13 and a 1. Point, basically a 1.6 inch valve on the exhaust. And I will say, I remember back in the old days when we were running the 350 Chevys, a 202 was considered a large valve and a 1.5 or a 1.6 exhaust. This engine's running a 2.13 and a 1.6, essentially a 1.59. GM spent a lot of time on the heads on this engine. From what I understand, millions of cat hours on the head. And that has to do with combustion efficiency, direct injection, keeping the valves clean. We don't even have to go into it. But I'm sure GM has invested a lot of money into these heads. As we stated earlier, the crankshaft is forged steel. The connecting rods are forged powdered metal. The pistons are forged aluminum. So we got some premium parts in this. We're running a hydraulic roller tappet cam, which is pretty standard. I think the 500 or half inch lift intake and 560 exhaust is, again, pretty healthy. I remember back in the day, these numbers would be considered like an RV cam, something more than production. And what I find a little interesting is that on a blown engine, you can basically take a stock cam and get power with a blown engine. They're running a pretty healthy camshaft and pretty big valves for a blown engine. And I'm sure that's just because that goes across the rest of the LT lineup. But these specs would actually be pretty impressive for an engine that didn't have a blower on it. So here's our exhaust and our center line and all that. We've got a 1.8 rock run ratio. As you remember, the old small blocks were less than that. Looks like these specs are for a dry sump motor, but I'm sure the wet sump motor is not that much different. Here's our oil pressure. And remember, we do have variable oil pressure in this engine. Always run Dexos, guys, in your engines. That would be Mobile One, or there's a host of other Dexos out there now. But don't fool around. Run the oil that that GM tells you to run. Run a good oil filter. I always run the Delco oil filters. If you don't, you just take that chance of scattering a $13,000, $14,000 engine. We do got to run premium in this engine, and that's pretty obvious when you're putting out over 600 horsepower. But as I mentioned earlier, this engine is also considered one of the top performing American engines on pump gas. Yes, if you get some of these other blown engines and put them on race gas, they're going to outperform this engine. But for something that's running on pump gas that you could drive to the grocery store, this is pretty impressive on 92 octane. We got a red line of 6600 RPM, which is high. If you remember, the LSs did not go this high. In fact, the end of the world on most of the truck motors is about 6000 RPM. And even the LS3s, you had to mod them to really get this kind of RPM out of them. Now you can see that the LT went to a different firing order. Remember the old 1843-6572? I don't know why GM changed it. Maybe they have their reasons. Um, I don't think that this firing order sounds as good as the earlier firing order did when you're running pure dual exhaust, but it doesn't really matter. This is the firing order they settled on, and it seems to work pretty darn good. So I think that's it. We're probably going to go into some other language. Yep, French. So at the least, I would say the LT4 is a massively impressive engine. The LT5 kind of takes it over the top. But if this engine performs as well as I think it's going to in a Jeep, this is probably going to be one of the premium engine conversions. And it's going to be at a lower cost than some of its competition like the Hellcats and some of the other restricted engines. Um, it can be difficult to get engines at a Mopar sometimes where GM is pretty much cranking these things out like candy. So I think this engine is going to become top of the line, one of the top of the line engines, at least in the GM lineup for Jeep engine conversions. And that doesn't just include the JK, that's going to include the JL and the JT, because these engines are pretty compact. They fit in the JK and the JL just fine. We can put it in a 5.3, we can put it in a 6.2 LT1, we can put it in an LT4, and hopefully we'll eventually put it in an LT5. And I don't want to finish this video without mentioning the 10-speed transmission. Now, GM has not really jumped in with both feet supporting the 10-speed transmission yet, but when they do, you bet we're going to be there and we're going to be installing them because when you take the specs of this engine and you combine it with a 10-speed transmission, it's going to take that 650 horsepower engine and push it over to the 750 horsepower performance technology. So if we take an LT1 with 460 horsepower, my experience is it outperforms the 500 horsepower crate engines of the earlier technology, meaning no CVVT, no direct injection, no high compression. So if we take this LT4 with 650-ish horsepower, we put a 10-speed behind it with a massive torque that it's going to put out in the bottom end. I think this engine is going to outrun some of the 700 plus horsepower engines on pump gas and that's going to be very impressive so we should have a couple of these lt4s on the road soon stay tuned